Thank you very much, <clears throat> Martin. Um, of course, it's a, a d delight to be here, um, even in these virtual circumstances. I'm looking across at a, a rather empty auditorium, and I wish it were full, but I know behind that camera there, there are many people um, uh, who I've worked with, who I've loved getting to know, friends and colleagues, and I'm, I'm delighted that you're joining us. Uh, and even those, you know, joining a little later, a bit like Dave plus one, um, great, you will be able to see this many times over um, on, uh, on the website, the institution's website. Um, it is, of course, a, a great honor to, to have been invited here and to receive the gold medal. Um, I've long looked up at the list of, of names on the wall here and thought with great admiration about how many brilliant minds have contributed to the development of the art of structural engineering. Uh, to think that I might have become one of them is, is it was never on my mind and, and now is just a, a, a great honor. Um, but it's also a great opportunity for me to speak to you and, and maybe to try and pass on some of the things that I feel I've learned through this, this career of mine. Um, I've always had a vision as to what I was trying to do. I want to share that with you. But I also want to talk to you, of course, about what the climate emergency means to me, what it means to the world, what I think it means to you. I think these are um, really important, significant times, and I want to help everyone that I can see what I see and, and do what they can possibly do to help the, the situation. And I think Martin has been a, a massive supporter of this, and I feel um, I'm really important that this, this medal recognises um, the importance of climate emergency in our world. So enough of, of that, um, the thanks. Uh, I must move on and talk to you in the way I want to. Um, I'll, I'll explain in just a second um, how I'm going to go about this, but I just wanted to say, um, Mike Cook, um, my life has been pretty much devoted to serving as a, as a member, as a member of Bureau Hapold, um, as a graduate and finally as a partner and then chairman. Um, I also consider myself uh, a very much a part of Imperial College and the way they teach um, engineering, which I've been part of for many years, and the institution itself is very important to me. I wanted to put that at the very front of, of my speech. <clears throat> but of course I am human and I have other things to think about, but you see even in these pictures, engineering and architecture isn't, isn't far away. My favorite project in the middle, my favorite performers and, and mus uh, musical composers um, on, the, on the right hand side and, and so on. But I'm an engineer, I'm a researcher, and I'm a teacher. And those three parts of my life, um, I think, are all important. I don't think you can be an engineer without actually researching around what you're trying to do. And I think all the time when you're working with others, you're teaching each other. So whether I'm doing it at Imperial or I'm doing it in the office, um, it's, it's, it's all the same thing. Um, we are always teaching each other and passing on skills. Um, what I want to do tonight is is talk to you in this way. I want to talk to about you about how my career grew. And, in, and in, I've got this luxury of being able to look back on 45 years or so of, of a career uh, developing into a structural engineer. And what I think are the key steps in that, because I think any young engineers that are looking particularly might find it helpful to see what I can now see. And, and the first thing I want to talk about will be allies, the importance of allies and finding them um, finding your agenda, discovering that uh, to lead you forwards. It can change, but having an agenda at the time, um, then dealing with that, using those allies on the agenda to act, to work, to, to be an engineer and learn from that process. But that probably takes 10 or 15 minutes. Then I want to start talking to you about the future. So finding allies. I look back and I can remember before, while I was still at school, how important the library was. They built the most fabulous library, as you can see here, just on the outskirts of London. And I went there religiously every Saturday morning. And I learned so much from that resource, that local authority resource, a very valuable. It was a kind of internet of the day in the, in the 60s and 70s. I, I started being fascinated about the power of the built environment. I, when I found out that they were talking about four ring roads lo around London, a massive town planning ideas, I got very excited. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but this idea that, um, that people had to plan these things, which up till then I thought just happened, that there were people, and I found out from my parents, they were called civil engineers. Um, of course, structural engineers is a branch thereof. Um, but that this could have 
really powerful good impact, but I could see also that it can have really dangerous bad impact. I could see that at the time because they were starting to build the M25 quite near to where I live. My school was fine, um, and the great thing about that was it let me do other stuff. It didn't force me to do things I didn't want, really, um, and that allowed me to get involved with music and make really great friends in that way. And um, over the, those early years in my A-levels, I started to be fascinated by things that were happening. Um, the, the bridge, the Seven Bridge, the um, uh, uh, Sydney Opera House, those were the sort of icons. And I remember doing, doing talks at school to tell people why I found them fascinating. It also got me into Cambridge, strangely, because I seemed to know more about the Sydney Opera House because I'd seen a television programme than my interviewers. Um, getting them into Cambridge was a handy thing because it gave me a gap year. And I had, with this inspiration and excitement, I managed to get a job at Overup, of course, the engineers of the Sydney Opera House. And after a, an unsuccessful start there, I asked to be moved, and I was moved to work with Ted Happel. That was the most fantastic thing I ever did, was to go to the personnel and say, please, can, I, can you find me a, an exciting team to work with? And they, they certainly delivered. He knew Fry Otto, and that coming together of the engineer architect Fry Otto and the coming together of, of Ted and his team of engineers showed me this, this kind of interplay between the sort of cerebral world of thinking architecture and the science of thinking um, engineering and, and actually bring it together around nature, which is the way Fry Otto worked. So my very early days at 18, I was so lucky at Arabs um, to be working with a team that did things so differently. I'm working on this project in Man um, for Mannheim, which got built. I was hanging nails on a model, and you can see at the bottom left of the, of the slide there, and getting a feel for buckling, complex behaviours. I, I was testing them out even at 18. I was so lucky. Um, and they were, of course, repeating some of the ideas that came from, from people like Gaudi, the finding of form through upside-down hanging change. I was fascinated when I discovered that. And I found that Fry Otto was really looking for a new kind of architecture which felt human. And by following nature, it was both minimal material, uh, because nature is so economic with material, but it was also human friendly. It was felt right. It wasn't bombastic. It wasn't arrogant. It came from nature. And that seemed to become such an important part of my thinking. So I got fascinated with how nature works and builds and, and how it minimizes material that it needs to use and so on. So I discovered this, this bank of inspiring people. It was really, really exciting. At which point I left and went off to Cambridge. And I have to admit, I have to find my own inspiration pretty much because engineering can be quite a dull thing when it's taught in a very academic manner. But I did at least get some money from the college and with my friend Pat Dallard, for whom I give credit to this photo, a rather bedraggled ex-hippie in a Paris car park called Paris Lay-By, and we went down to see the beautiful viaducts of, of Eiffel before we took a quiet detour, which we haven't told the college about, to go down to Saint-Tropez and Nice and have a good time. But um, we managed to get a good collection of photos from uh, Eiffel. Um, so there I am. I just thought I'd make sure. That is me. Um, I don't look that much older. And that was kind courtesy of his mother's mini, by the way. Um, but having survived Cambridge, as I would put it, um, I went back to join Ted. And he'd moved from Arabs, surprisingly, to Bath. But I wanted to stick with Ted. Ted was the, the person that had really set things up for me and made, made the world fascinating. And so with that founding of Bureau Hapold, with these partners, I'd found, I'm sure, my allies. And that was such an important early step um, that I, I want to emphasize that to, to, to you starting in your career. Uh, and you'll find as you go through your career, finding the, the right allies is really important. And I'll come back to that. Um, then discovering an agenda. Um, how does that happen? Well, of course, I'd already started working on things like the Mannheim project that, that were different. They dared to be different. And these were engineers who didn't worry that they'd not done something before. So every time they asked me to do something, like here, build a model of this weird humpy tent, um, I kind of didn't realize that we were sort of reinventing things. We, these things hadn't been done before. And so building models was a great way of saying, well, does it work? It's best we do it at one to 100 scale. Otherwise, uh, we might go out there at one to one scale and find it didn't work. And of course, you had to measure these models because there were no computer models to give you the data. So you measured them so you could cut the fabric and so on. Um, but not that long after I joined, um, Ted wanted me to go and do some research because he had some research grant money and it was in air supported structures so still pretty weird stuff and it seemed that nobody really knew how they worked so I had plenty to look into and that became quite interesting. 
And while I was there, we started modeling other projects, tension structures, uh, rigidizing them so they could go in wind tunnel models. And, and I felt there was a sort of process going on here where I was building you know, models, uh, measuring the models, testing them, and then learning from that. So it was, a, it was really an extension of university, but so, so much more um, the way I felt I was learning, hands-on experience of that. And I put up here in the change of title, practice, research, teach, just coming back to that. It's a very similar sort of idea. And I think in doing the practice, designing and building, um, doing the research that allows you to do that in a different way, bringing new ideas into that, into that work, is, is the research that of, of, a, of a life of an engineer. And then passing that on both to the team that's around you that needs to learn and going out to teach um, up and coming engineers is really valuable. And I will come back to that theme. But um, so the so the projects went on. We were building models at the university, um, and then we were getting built out on site. And and this was a fabulous way to learn um, and embed research into into my thinking. I think, including even a scheme for a giant township with a big air supported structure over it in Alberta, and and in the, in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh, a, a fabulous project. I just worked on some of the detail, but a beautiful project with membrane structures, cable net structures, and big solid wall structures, which made a beautiful oasis on the edge of, of Saudi Arabia, still well worth, worth a visit, the Al Turaq Palace. Um, and I, I think what we were, we were finding, and I was discovering that this was in the end talking about how can you create better environments for people? This was about people, which was really where Fry Otto was coming from, beautiful places which gave comfortable spaces um, be looked beautiful and had a kind of natural beauty to them. And it, it seemed just just perfect. I, I couldn't see how I could contradict that. And, and it was clear that that goes right back to the sort of early engineering, early building, where you, you used your local materials. You, you used them as efficiently as you possibly could because they were precious. And you, took, you built in forms which were relevant, shapes which were relevant, like domes, um, like... Um, net structures to support your skin cloth and so on so that early thinking um, that even we as humans were using in our in our building development came out of nature and i think we were trying to go back to that thinking um, in what we were doing with tension structures and so on and so that became my agenda really and through my life and i'll show you a few projects um, this agenda was about how can we get closer to what nature does if nature does it it does it for a reason how can we learn from that and and make our structures better and when i found allies mainly architects but clients as well that were interested in that then i was really really singing i'm really happy so we've got allies and we've got an agenda. Now we have to get on with it and do something. So I call this acting and learning. I first thought, well, let's do some acting. What, what did I do? Um, and it's, it's kind of a series of projects that I just want to share with you. Really weird air supported structure things um, on the left uh, in 1984. Some less weird um, Westminster and Chelsea Hospital roof um, using the cushions in a very early ETFE cushion project. Um, these were the realities of, of my air supported structures work. And we did a, a, a not built um, airship for the German uh, Navy, which was quite exciting. Uh, I never thought I'd be designing airships. But it soon moved on into tension structures, cables, um, and shells. And early in the you know, mid 80s here, going out to, in, to Zimbabwe to, to uh, with Ian Liddell, design um, this giant tent. You can see how giant on the left hand side with those two tiny little figures. Um, on the screen. They are people um, at the foot of one of the masts. Um, and I think this part of my career was really important. I was at around 29.30 and I remember I actually had to come back to the UK um, and do my structures exam. Um, so it was quite an important time for that as well. Uh, and after Zimbabwe, it was Hong Kong. And, and with Sue, uh, we had a year in Hong Kong. While I tried to work out with a wonderful Japanese engineer, which is why I say learning how to collaborate. Um, we, he, he didn't speak much English. I certainly didn't speak any Japanese. So, you know, using diagrams and hand signals and smiles to communicate while we try to work out how to put up this rather unusual, never built before, never built since, hanging cable net, uh, which we had to cast concrete around. Um, so I was very fortunate to have these, these early experiences on site where we had to create a way of building things from basics. And I had to do it with teams 
work out how to collaborate and talk to them. In Zimbabwe, no one had ever put up a tent. I didn't like to tell them I hadn't either, uh, but I was at least expected to show them how to do it. And then things got a bit more normal. Back, I got my structures exam, of course, I was a bit more respectable, um, and I could be sent off uh, by Michael Dixon, who was my boss then at, at, at Bureau Happel, to do some more serious stuff. Where I, I came across um, Ian Sharrett and, and Peter Romanick at Hopkins Architects. They were lovely to work with because they really wanted to listen, and they really wanted to make the building express the flow of forces and the engineering ideas. So you can see in the metal shop there, the way the beams hit the columns was expressed in the facade and the columns taper from thin at the top to thick at the bottom. So they grow like a tree out of the ground and thinner and thinner as they go up. And they let me put a bit of membrane shading in as well so I could token to my membrane history. Great experience. And that fact that I was working with architects who really wanted to work together, you know, collaborating with, with, with the engineer, listening to the ideas of the engineer, was a great, great beginning of my sort of next stage, my um, post-tent stage of career. We're in the 90s now, early 90s, and it's worth just pointing out, we, it was known that we had a problem, that we were growing, we were, we were prolific, proliferating, um, and we were using more and more resources. And there was an extrapolation that said, you know, this was going to, we were going to run out of, we were going to run out of resources. So keeping things lean and using less was the big theme of the day. Um, how you reduce uh, the need for material in your projects, how you refurbish where you possibly can, how you reuse like a hermit crab, uh, other people's structures, um, and how you recycle like a spider that eats the web and then makes another one. When, when necessary. Fantastic ideas from nature as to how to use less material. So there were certain projects where we could play that game too. And there's some pictures of some which I won't, won't dwell on. I carried on, but um, <clears throat> with that sort of theme of using least material, it carried on, but it started to become a bit more respectable. Um, it, you know, these aren't projects overseas, they're now in the UK. And this project in London um, for the Imagination headquarters um, was an important one for me. It got um, it got us doing membrane structures, unusual structures, working with Ron Heron, the fantastic architect, um, and John Randall with him, um, uh, doing unusual things with existing buildings. And it got a lot of notice in the press. Uh, it, uh, unusual buildings like working with Andrew Best, who I know is watching here from Berlin and having a bit of a party. So here we worked together on this unusual projects that were, that were coming through. Um, some more are more uh, perhaps ordinary, but working on Excel, I was I learned a lot from from designing um, as the engineering designer on on Excel. Um, we wanted to have exoskeletal structure. We played with all sorts of different ideas. By going in this way, we were able to make the roof really light. Um, but I stumbled at the last hurdle when I discovered that for construction purposes, the fabricator in the end wanted it to be stiffer than I had wanted it to be. So it wasn't as light as I'd, I'd intended. So I learned from that that you have to really think hard about how the contractor is going to build it. And maybe they don't want it as its minimum weight. Now, things are different now. We really need, do need to look after our resources and, and our carbon footprint. So perhaps we'd have made a different decision and the contractor would have done the first design. Moving on from that, just around as we were moving up to, to year 2000, things got very exciting because there was money in the UK to build very special projects. And I was fortunate enough to start work on the competition with a team at Foster and Partners for the British Museum roof. And we were able to uh, play with that design over a period of a year or so until we'd really tuned it into this incredible, elegant, lightweight shell virtually without computers, but we brought in Chris, Chris Williams from uh, Bath University to, to help us with the new technology of form finding using the computer for shells. Um, other shells started to develop out of that relationship with Foster and Partners, which just carried on so um, effectively um, because they wanted to work with engineers um, in a kind of collaborative way. This lightweight shell in, in for Sage in Gateshead, there are some of the models that we made in the first week. Um, and there you can see in construction the lightest possible form of, of these, these, these beams are curving over the top of the concrete box, which is the concert hall, but they don't touch it. Um, this is about the lightest roof we've ever managed to do. And it's actually built in an incredibly simple way. So working out how to construct, um, and, but yet creating an elegant shell became a, an important theme. As we move um, over to the States, again working with Foster's, 
the uh, roof at the um, uh, museum in, in, in Smithsonian, Washington, DC, had um, similar ideas. But the, the thing the, we were able to do was incorporate a number of shell forms to get stiffness in the way that a snail does in their own shell and use least material. But we used the depth of the material to create acoustics, um, an improved acoustics and an improved shading system. So that, as I say here, more than just a roof. So learning about, it wasn't just about structure engineering, it was about how the structural engineering can, can work with the environmental ideas, the, uh, as well as the architect, to have, create a solution that's kind of integrates everything in one, one thing. And I think the client really appreciated the quality that that, that gave. The elephants rather appear to pretty of this one in Copenhagen, uh, the, the zoo. But I think worth getting away from the shells and saying occasionally it makes sense to use membranes. And I know when, when we first looked at this, uh, Norman Foster had already said, what about um, putting a membrane over this old railway station? Could that be a solution to allow us to save the steelwork and just put a light roof on it? Uh, because they were commissioned to renovate uh, Dresden railway station. Traditionally, they were they were generally having to um, demolish them because the the, the, um, the heavyweight roofs are, uh, were too heavy to be supported by the aging steelwork. But by putting on a membrane roof, uh, we were able, actually able to save the steel. Um, and so this was it was a very good in terms of low carbon, a very thin material just stretching across, replaced a very heavy roof and saved the the steel from needing to be replaced. The final project I wanted to share with you out of this sequence, really, which I, you know, did, did, did I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, uh, was a cable net in, in Astana, which I say that is designed to in, uh, inspire because it was such a focal point in the new city of Astana. Um, and this was a chance really to go right back to the to the Fry Otto thinking of how can you create, you know, a really big a roof, a really, really big space um, with um, the least material. And a, a radial cable net and a single mast seem to be the right answer. You can see me here on the left uh, selling a few different ideas to uh, a variously bored looking client, but I'm sure they were fascinated. It just clicked the camera at the wrong, wrong time. And I was finding even back then, um, you know, when we did have computer technology, we could show them computer generated forms. The physical model that we could poke and prod and I could show the differences was still really, really important there. So that was my, my acting. That was a little series of projects I wanted to share with you. But we were learning, you know, we are always learning from these things as time goes on. And, and of course, you know, I could see that, and I'd go through it quickly through this, that other ways of teaching people, showing people how things will work is really, have been really important. Even the Utzon sketch and then Arab's interpretation of that as how as an engineer they felt they could get that fabricated really, really important. So I just wanted to show that this has been a really important learning point for me, finding ways to share ideas with, with other people and, and bring in this idea of co-creation. So I just wanted to share with you a few sketches that, from my notebooks because I've been keeping notebooks um, towards the uh, this la latter part of my career particularly. Um, the Smithsonian roof and, and generating ideas about how we introduce the three, the three dome effects and moving it away from a flat roof to a curvy one, and then how we solve the beautiful intersection of the column into the into the roof and, and so on. Similarly with Khan Shatir, you know, those early sketches, often they were done on aeroplanes, so we could pass them backwards and forwards to each other after we'd been, been out there or been to Turkey to see the contractor. And I'm a great fan and, and, and really would want to pass that on to, to people that the quickly done sketch in the meeting at the moment, you, you don't go away and, and generate something more beautiful, you can do that too. But the sharing of ideas in a creative way and allowing other people to join in is, is crucial to me. And that's shown here as well, where we're not talking about a project, we're actually talking about a concept of how you organize, I don't know what it is, a course or, or a structural team or something like that. And sharing those ideas, I find it so much more successful if I can sketch it. And I know everyone even now who works with me realizes that that's happening and that's a bit of a, a thing that they expect me to do. I'm almost a disappointment if I don't get, get my pen and paper out and show, show people. So there is a book coming out. I've put the word drawn thought there um, and that should be out by the end of the, end of the year, I think. Um, and it's been important to me to look back at how I have used this technique and I want to be able to pass that on. Um, finally, I thought just to quickly say there has been technology 
technology has been moving forward. One of the things that I have found been fascinating to use technology for is getting deeper into the human experience of these buildings. It's fine, you can analyze stresses, you can analyze airflows and so on, but the emotional experience of people in these buildings. And we've started to do that in, in more and more detail at, at Bureau Happold. I'm not going to show you, this isn't going to be a talk about that, but when you start to look, for instance, about, about new concert halls, you know, the whole experience of using that hall, as well as the experience of the performance and the art, how do people feel um, when they do that? I think the digital world is getting us, us closer to understanding people-centered design, and that people-centered design is a crucial thing. Finally, actually, learning from teaching, as I mentioned at Imperial College, I've learned so much. The years I've spent teaching civil engineers to think creatively, to think about about people and their plight and how we can help help people through engineering and as i put it here it's not just thinking about what we do and how we do it but asking why we do it what's its purpose what's the purpose of being a civil engineer maybe trying to help them find an agenda that they can believe in and then use it um, in their in their careers we're now of course focusing very strongly at imperial and and actually in practice on the sustainable development goals and that widens out that widens out the thinking to people and also to the planet, to the environment. These two projects, the Bureau of Happel projects that I'm very proud of, they weren't mine, but, but this impact in New York of the High Line and the impact in the, of the Wadi Hanifa redevelopment in, in Riyadh, such important projects in terms of bringing delight and, and um, fresh comfort and green life and fish into the hearts of cities. These are the sorts of projects that I'll be talking about in a minute which is the future imperatives. It's what, it, what do we need to be looking at for the future? And I'm gonna to have to go fairly fast, I think. Um, I had a wake up call a year ago. I had a wake up call, thanks, thanks here to Steve Tompkins, uh, coming down from a, pro a project in, in Leeds that we were doing. Um, and he introduced me to the fact that they were about to launch a climate and biodiversity declaration uh, for architects to sign up to um, under an umbrella called Construction Declares. It immediately seemed to me and to him that we needed the same for engineers. And I took it under my wing to get that going. Um, I was got the structural uh, the institution, in fact, here in Baswick Street, the next day, as luck would have it, with a whole group of kind of distinguished engineers, because it was the awards panel uh, that was sitting. And I said, look, I want to do this. We want to do this. Are you happy with that? We were. Martin Powell was happy with it. So off it went. And the declaration was was created. Um, it highlights here, which I'm not going to, in, you know, to, 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 to go through in too much detail, but the idea was that we admit to the fact that we as engineers have been part of the creation of a problem. We have been part of the creation of a decaying uh, planet, a decaying climate through a decaying atmosphere. Um, and we want to commit to doing something about it. We want to work together, collaborate, um, to help transform the situation back. So we want to take action. Um, I also met Hugh Montgomery, a fantastic, intelligent medic. It's a real coincidence that I happened to see him. He came and gave a lecture, and he really moved me um, over the detail that he was able to share. And I could see that it, this was about others. It wasn't just about an engineering thing and about the built environment. The, the, you know, medicine, get, uh, and medics were excited and getting involved. I could see that if the world changes, then it wasn't going to be so hard for us to start to be able to deliver to a kind of new world, a new type of uh, building, um, which was going to help the planet rather than harm it. He used to tell a joke uh, about a sick planet. So on the right, you've got Earth. Earth is feeling sick and it's going up to a rather well looking planet and saying, Oh God, I really, I feel really sick. I've got this horrible temperature. I can't really, I can't breathe. You know, things are just not right. You know, what do you think I should do? And the healthy planet, sort of with great sort of sympathy, says, "Yeah, no, no, no don't, don't, don't worry. You've just got a, a, you've just got a case of Homo sapiens, and it won't last long." And I love that. I love that. And he was really embarrassed because he uses that joke wherever he goes. But you know, we won't last long. We will not last long. And the planet won't mind. They all got rid of that problem. Uh, but do we want it like that? So I realized that during my career, I was born in 55, things really started to accelerate in terms of the uh, carb carbon dioxide emissions, greenhouse gases, um, and they really started to accelerate in the 70s when I started to become an engineer. So 
there was no doubt that there was a major problem and that the problem in a way is about the good news is we are more prosperous and the good news is that that prosperity is passing across from just a small part of the world to a larger and larger part of the world. And that's got to be good news. But the way we're doing it, fueled by carbon, is massively doing harm. And what we've got to do is not cut down on prosperity, but we've got to cut out the carbon. And the same, all the other graphs, you know, our prosperity with, you know, goes up as the carbon goes up. Uh, illiteracy illiteracy goes down as our carbon goes up so what do we do how do we break that 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 link because we want to improve literacy we want people to prosper in more and more parts of the world and of course this is unequal as well because the nations that are contributing most are prospering the most and the 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 south the global south who doesn't really contribute that much is um is is not prospering so there's an inequality in this. So we've seen this um, exponential de uh, urban development. We've seen this exponential growth in CO2 emissions for transport. We've seen air pollution, land pollution. It's all tangible and it's destroying. Um, what we are doing is destroying the very thing, the earth that supports us. It's, it's, it's bonkers. Now, I think the thing that really caught me um, was how the, the nature is, is starting to, the planet is now starting to join in. You know, as with climate change, the tundra falls out, we get carbon emissions and we even get uh, fires. As, as the forests uh, dry out, um, they burn. Um, not only are we losing a carbon sink because they're not sequestering carbon, but they're giving off carbon dioxide. The shrinking ice caps means the white of the, of the, uh, of the polar caps is no longer reflecting heat. Uh, the melting sea ice uh, starts to contribute to sea levels and and of course they rise. So the outcomes that we're all seeing are very, very clear. I don't really need to go through them in, in, in water levels, in severe weather storms, and of course leading to hunger, thirst, and, and huge areas which were fit for habitation suddenly not being fit for habitation. People need to move. When people need to move, we have a massive refugee problem of, from all sides. Um, people who are who don't have much having to move, but people who do have much also having to move um, in more prosperous parts or having to fight, spend a huge amount of money to survive. Um, and out of that, with people starting to move across boundaries, of course, we are in danger of conflict leading to war. Again, always it's inequi in there's inequity. Um, the nations that are hardest hit are least able to cope. And we need strong global leadership to help us through this. And of course, you know, I did have some rather dodgier pictures of our global leaders, but these, I think they'd actually rather like to be portrayed um, in, the, in this manner, but um, we need them to be united. And I would say that there's nothing that's been happening in the last six months uh, that suggests that in a crisis we unite, and that's really disturbing. But talking about uniting, I wanted to just talk briefly about the institution because they really have united Whilst the um, declaration was, was an independent thing set up um, you know, outside of the institution, it's been hugely supported by, by Martin and the institution. And we're working very hard with a small climate emergency task group to help set standards, as it says at the bottom, that's what institutions do. What are the right standards? Raise those standards, help people raise them, support the profession, and encourage cross-industry collaboration. So across the collaboration, all of these important groups in the, in the UK um, and in the US as well, there, where we're, we're working, working together and influencing each other and sharing knowledge with them, are supporting the profession. We're having conferences to bring in companies, uh, people who lead the companies, working in the companies, to help them understand what they need to do with the company um, to meet the, the declaration. Uh, we're working, we've worked up a new a plan of works 2020, which includes commitments to, uh, to planning uh, for sustainability and reducing carbon. Uh, we're developing a shared database. So there's a lot of work happening to help companies too. Very much raising standards. There's a website now, which is, has a huge section on climate emergency. The Structural Engineer, the, the magazine that everyone gets, has full of it. So anyone who isn't looking at the magazine or looking at the website, do, do start doing that as a regular thing because you will get well-informed. It will give you guidance, good ideas, thought pieces, 
And now there's the How to Calculate Embodied Carbon guide, which is available free for everybody. And we're moving into uh, scores, which is, which is a way of starting to set um, targets for carbon in buildings based on sensible, achievable um, guides. A lot of this work done by a, a small group of, of people, um, very much led by Y. Will Arnold, who works part time in the institution and is doing great work. Um, and also now within the institution, a lot is changing in terms of the definition of what good looks like, the structural awards, CPD helping and, uh, the, and starting to look at the code of conduct. We have to start looking at the standards that we set as, as an institution and, and raising the game. There's not time to go into the detail of everything, but there's a lot that you can do. And we're telling you that in the journal. Um, so do take, take a, lot, a look at that. Um, and our information is around that. But I do want to, to say that I think there's, there's something here about the responsibility of being a professional. And that includes being a professional structural engineer and being held to account, dare I say it, by future generations, by clients in the future, by government even in the future. And I just wanted to pose this to you. You know, you've got to be thinking about how will you respond uh, to children or grandchildren, future generations? What did you do about the climate emergency? You, you understood, you're professional, you were building buildings. You'd been told, you knew. Um, why didn't you do anything or what did you do to try to stop it? You know, this is something will come back stronger and stronger in the future. And the same will happen with our clients. We are professional advisors. Um, they're going to be asking, maybe in five or ten, or maybe it'll only be one year, why didn't you tell me that what I briefed you with wasn't right, you know, it, that it would actually do harm? And now I'm ha having trouble because nobody wants to use my building or rent my building because it doesn't comply with their company requirements or their personal values. You should have told me. And if you didn't, I think you can worry. And the government, as far as the industry goes, if the industry doesn't respond, I mean, the government has declared a net zero economy by 2050. It may tighten up those, uh, we hope, uh, towards uh, the, uh, you know, as time goes on. But, um, you know, what were you, the industry, waiting for? You know, we, we, it's, you should have known what to do. So the only choice the government has now is to institute draconian legislation. So this is a graph which sort of shows that build up. Um, you can do something as, as, as an engineer today, but if you join up, if you join up with other engineers or you join up with your architects or you join up with your clients and start to plan, you can plan to reduce carbon. You can change the brief. Uh, you can change the vision of the project. To, to be honest, it still leaves a big residual challenge. So here it is in very simple star terms. Personal carbon footprint, you can do something. Uh, reducing the carbon in your designs by thinking about the material spec, you can do something more. Building less, thinking about not needing to build, you can do a great deal more. If you then start to adapt regenerative design, you can do a great deal more. Regenerative design is healing. It's something that is, is carbon uh, negative. It, it starts to reduce the carbon um, in the atmosphere. Uh, I want to just talk about that. I'm going to have to do it quite briefly because I can see um, if we're going to hit the seven o'clock, we're going to really have to move. So um, this regenerative way forward um, is, is, a tr is a proper uh, way of, of assessing a project, a living building challenge. And it looks at uh, the place and how you affect land. It looks water and how you nurture water on your site. It looks at energy and where you source your energy. It looks at health and happiness and how people will will live and use that building and live a better life. It looks at the materials and how you recycle materials, you use recycled materials. It's a catalog of things to think about. Um, it looks even about the equity, the way that your project will integrate with society and provide uh, better terms for everybody, a better life for everybody and contribute to that. And of course, it looks at beauty too. So all of these things are, are there to be grasped. And, and this is something that's, um, it's, it's something that's handleable and doable. So I would really urge you for people who want to go further than just chipping up a bit, a bit of carbon here and there, um, start looking at something like this as a guide. Um, and I'm just gonna click through these slides because there isn't time, but you can see, and you'll find all this um, very easily accessible on their website, but they guide you through how can you can make much, much better decisions about all of the things that matter and how you can turn a project 
into something which will be carbon negative. And I guarantee you that the majority of clients will be very interested because they are looking at ways to answer the sorts of questions that I've been posing you. You know, am I going to be liable for failure? Failure, and how are I going to face my grandchildren's questions? I want to be doing this. You, my professional, need need to help me, and you will be able to if you go in this direction. And it's spreading quite fast. I'm proud to say the Bureau had offices in in West Coast America, as you can see on that map, are the busiest um, over this kind of kind of work, regenerative design. But the final thing, with all the stars. Is, is even going beyond that. And this is the big challenge for the future is how do we change the paradigm? It's what we say we want to do and that we know has to be done in the declaration. Out of that, I'd say we've got this admit, we've got this collaborate, we've got this transform, but there needs to be that vision. And I think the vision is for a safe and just space for humanity. And that's where Kate Rayworth comes in. Book called Donut Economics, which is becoming almost a, a sort of, um, I don't know, a little black book of, of people like me um, and people in business and people who are looking to change and cities who are looking to change their strategies as well. Uh, that book is guiding people towards the donut. And in very simple terms, the donut is saying outside the perimeter of the donut, you hit uh, the ecological ceiling. Things like climate change, um, um, excessive climate change, land, water and air, uh, pollution and, um, and corruption, biodiversity uh, loss and so on. All those things, that ecological ceiling, which you can see on the outer ring, mustn't be overshot. And we are overshooting it, but it's a way of looking at your economy and seeing where is it overshooting the most and what are we going to do about that? And then the social foundations is the other thing. You can't just shut down everything and, and not worry about the, the safeness, the health and safety of the people, the peace and justice in the society, the education, the equity, all those things. So in there, you mustn't fall short. And, and so this staying on that green zone of the donut, and that is a really important thing, and it's really taking currency in the, in, in the world. I would talk to you this about this. This is a piece of work that Construction Declares has been doing um, to look at tipping points and how we can move um, from the left-hand side where the red, uh, we have to highlight all the shortcomings of what we've currently got, and the green, we have to start building support for new mindsets, new mindsets towards the, to the, towards the green. That, that mindset that's in the minority now needs to become the majority. And, and that needs massive uh, effort. And that's what I just want to share with you now, one of my last um, major areas. So I think there are things that we can spot. There is event stimuli, I'm talk, talk, calling them here. Things out there that people can see that are stimulating change. This is the change that gets us from the way we think now about the hunger for carbon and the way we, we see growth as the only solution and the way we need to think and the drivers that will change that. So let me just go through those quickly with you. So these events, I mean, COVID is one of those major events that makes us stop and think and question. These are really important when people are questioning things. The fires that we're seeing, where whatever country, but California at the moment, make us question, we must be doing something wrong. The rising sea levels. Um, these are events that stimulate change. The, the, Black, the Black Lives Matter and other demonstrations, people, these are events which make, make people question the status quo. These are really important if we're going to change the status quo. And then there are drivers, slightly more prosaic things that, that can help us, and we've got to grasp all of these. So technological change, engineers like that sort of thing. But can, does it help us? build buildings with less material? Does it help us not have to demolish buildings? Does it help us build buildings much more accurately? How far can we take those technical changes? I've already mentioned the way that we can introduce some of those technologies to deliver regenerative um, projects. It needs technology to be able to do that. So those are technical changes. There are social changes that are happening. They're very important. Um, clim um, the the um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Climate Assembly, the way that people are congregating around these important issues. That will grow and grow, and we need to build off that. Um, the social change that 
that the new digital connections uh, that COVID is to somewhat uh, supporting are also important. Education is starting to change. I won't dwell, dwell on that slide. Um, the way we're thinking about education, Joint Board of Murrays has been changing things. Tim Ivel has helped that for sure. Um, some of our clients are demanding change and some of their clients, the customers on the street, they're looking for change. They want to change their lifestyles. People are now starting to ask engineers, you know, how can you help me address what my new clients are telling me? The Bank of England and investment choices, they are changing. Um, this thing called climate related financial disclosures, um, it's going to get harder and harder to borrow money for development that doesn't have a decarbonizing agenda. Um, these things are going to affect our clients and we need to be on top of it, how we're going to deliver uh, to those changes. We need to start planning in terms of the scenarios. This graph on the left, you know, things could go horribly bad, be pear-shaped and we go above six degrees. If things go really well, we might keep at two. Um, but you need to be planning with your client for the worst case and the middle case and the best case scenarios and start to discuss what's the right solution for them. And we're seeing businesses changing. Um, businesses changing, including like the B Corps here, businesses which are starting to think very differently about what drives them. It's not, it's not, not about just about growth for growth's sake. It's about how can they care for the environment, for the workers, for the customers and so on. More and more organizations doing that. And governments, finally, um, cities are really moving and they're important customers for many engineers. The government has already made a declaration for net zero. COP uh, next year is a really important point in that where they need to be showing that Britain is making massive progress. All the governments do, but if UK as the host isn't showing that, it'll be really bad. So this is a fantastic driver. So all these drivers to change add up to a lot. Then we've got to make the most of them if we're going to make this paradigm shift. So here are a couple, four little graphs. Here is what we've got to do. Here is the global prosperity graph, and we've got a carbon fueled, what I'm calling here degenerative growth pattern. It's rising and rising to the now point. We have to force it down. We have to go into massive decline. What needs to come back and replace it, look at the uh, now point. We've got to start building the regenerative thinking and the regenerative um, uh, construction and ideas. And out of that, we will build the combination of the carbon fuel degenerative and the new regenerative will give us a growth curve. It will give us increased prosperity. We need to make sure that prosperity has a, has a level of equity in it. It will need greater government co cooperation. We need to really recognize that we're in a global economy and we all rely on each other. And out of that, you can see what drives that are these things I've just gone through with you, the social, the technical, the demand side changes, the financial drivers, the business changes and different businesses with new visions and government. All those things we need to see happen. We need to stimulate them when we have the opportunity and we need to address our ability as engineers to be ready and, and even to push some of that change and support that change to be able to get to that point that we want. So in summary, this is what we've been talking about, finding allies, discovering an agenda, acting and learning future imperatives. I would say this is still as important for me now and for everybody, not just at the start of a career. I think we as businesses, engineers, architects, clients, contractors, all who share that vision have got to get together and really respect that and work together. We've got to understand that there is a way of us to do this that's not a risk because we're, um, we're, we're partnering together in the way that we're going to get through this. And we need to use those alliances and get that out to the public. We need to all get this agenda. I would say the construction industry is far too fa fa fragmented and it needs to get its act together. And then clients and government can get behind it with confidence. And that's something that I know we're working on uh, beyond in places like the Royal Academy. And action, get it, get it going. Uh, we do seriously need to think about, do we need funding and fuel to fuel some of this connecting up of the industry and so on to build the bridges. But we certainly need to be building bridges in the way that I think we have been. I've just put into the slideshow so you can go back to it. I've done a lot of reading and I've done a lot, lot of book looking. I really probably got a carbon footprint from too many books, but I wanted to put these in because there's a lot out there fabulous stuff a very wide range of, of ideas you'll find others but do pick up one or two of these books and go on and don't forget donut economics really important um, so finally who's who has the last word in this 
Well, I thought maybe David Attenborough should, and I hope you've all seen, I haven't dared look at it yet, but I will, Extinction the Facts, it was broadcast not long ago. I do believe that together we can create a better future. If we make the right decisions at this critical moment, we can safeguard our planet's critical ecosystems, its extraordinary biodiversity and all its inhabitants. What happens next is up to every one of us. And we have to believe uh, David Attenborough. Um, finally, though, I thought maybe a joke. This is a common joke. You may have seen it already, but it's a lovely joke. About there's a lecture going on. And somebody is saying what we need in this climate summit is all of these changes. We need energy independence. We need to preserve the rainforest. We need livable cities. We need clean water. We need healthy children. And somebody saying, what if, if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Well, it doesn't really need answering, of course. You know. And what this is absolutely in front of us is a golden opportunity for we engineers to step forward and do something. And that's what I hope we can all do. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. For, for any of you who may have joined late, the gold medal is the highest honor this institution can confer on an individual in recognition of excellence and an outstanding contribution to the advancement of structural engineering. Mike, you are a very worthy recipient. If I have done my research correctly, you're the 54th recipient and join the rank of other illust illustrious past winners from the Bureau Happel staple, uh, namely Sir Ted himself, whom you've mentioned in 1991, followed by Ian Liddell in 1999, and then Paul Westbury in 2012. Mike, it, it now gives me great pleasure, very great pleasure to present to you your gold medal. By some sort of wizardry, the medal I've given you here in Northern Ireland has appeared around your neck. Um, we offer you our heartiest congratulations. You may not hear the audience clapping, but you've heard a, a small representative sample from headquarters. Over to you. Thank you very much, Don. Yes, here's the medal safe, safe in, in my hands, and here is the um, certificate, uh, shiny gold. I'm really delighted to have, and thank you very much, Don, for, for stretching your arms all the way across across the Irish Sea to be able to give that to me. And thank you, Martin, for, for that. Um, it is, of course, I don't, I haven't got time, and I, I, I shouldn't give a long speech, but it is, it is a real honour. Uh, the institution has been uh, an important part of my professional life, and I'm delighted to say that it's never been a more important part of my professional life than it is now. Um, it's support um, for me and helping me uh, move in the direction I've wanted to go um, to try to help cement the industry around climate emergency, to help structural engineers and so on. Whatever I do, it's never going to be enough. And whatever I do, it will be mainly about encouraging others and what they do. But I think it's really fantastic that the institution has almost noted the importance of that climate work um, in where it, where it put the medal. But so I am deep, deeply on it and, and really, really grateful for, for that. And I look forward to many more years working with the institution on, on similar goals. And I hope working with young engineers um, and helping them you know, guide their career in the, right, in the right way. So thank you very much, Don. Yeah. I think, if, I think we're going to see if, if there are any questions. I rather rudely took up rather a lot of our time. But, but have you any questions I could answer? Yes, we, we have some questions. And thank you to all who have posted questions and comments. There were a number, Mike, relating to specific projects. And I don't think we will have time interesting, though that might be, to delve into that. So we'll maybe focus on the more general ones related to climate change. So I'm going to start off. Um, we, I'm going to. I've selected five, by the way. And apologies if we have a cut off for others. Uh, the first one is from Phoebe Moses, um, who says, "Is it better to design a high carbon structure which lasts hundreds of years, or a low carbon structure to reduce emissions urgently now?" And that's asked in the context of the highly seismic New Zealand arena. Uh, where they're aiming for low damage design? The answer doesn't take long, really. Um, it's far better that we address the emergency now and 
we cannot afford to be creating very high carbon intensive buildings um, in, in, my, in my view. And we have to think really hard about that. Of course, I appreciate there's no magic wand. If we, if we see nuclear as a really important solution, we have to build safe nuclear power stations. But, but the main principle for the vast majority of engineers has to be to think very hard about the emissions now that are right up front in the construction of new buildings. And if at all possible, to look at how you reuse old buildings. Thank you. Second question is from Christy McDonald. Um, in terms of influencing clients on carbon matters, do you see different challenges for engineers working for domestic clients versus those working for global stroke corporate clients? I think that's something we could debate for quite a long time, but on the whole, I'd say no, not massive differences. Um, I think we are finding, you know, many clients, especially if you just start to engage them in the thinking, will very quickly start to want to know more about how their project can be less carbon intense, how it can be more socially responsible, how it can be better for nature. If you start talking to them about the positivities of regenerative design and showing them the photo sort of thing, I think domestic clients and major clients and developers um, are very, very interested. In some cases, both um, domestic and major developer clients have already got there. You know, um, people like Lendlease are already thinking so deeply about scenario planning and about how they reduce reduce carbon impacts and improve social well-being from their projects. So I think it's pretty pretty across the board. Thank you. There was an interesting question from Reese Morgan, but I'm not going to let you field it because you've already touched on it and it relates to the future education of our younger engineers, which you've highlighted as a very important topic. So yes. we'll let that one go if you don't mind. I may say, Don, it was a big feature of the iStructies academic conference just a week or two back. And when yeah. we devoted our whole, our whole half a day with, with, with academics and teachers sharing ways of increasing climate emergency understanding with their students. Good. The, ne the next one is from your friend Steve Tompkins, to whom you referred. He says, Mike, at the recent Henderson Colloquium, uh, Professor Julian Allgood memorably said that we will need to wean ourselves off both concrete and aviation until zero carbon alternatives are available. Do you think we are taking this advice seriously enough as construction professionals? No, we're not. Um, would you want me to say more? <laughs> I don't know if Steve wants me to say more. Um, I, I commend everyone to look look at what Julian Allwood and his team at UK Fires has been doing. It's, it's a fascinating piece of work and a really valuable, important piece of work. It does highlight the fact that un unless somebody miraculously invents a zero carbon concrete, it's going to be really uh, very soon become an untenable material. But of course, I know the concrete industry is working very, very hard on some of these things, and and we have to see what, what transpires. But I do think we're not taking these things seriously enough. And I think the the, the real ability to achieve even the government's current targets of, of net zero by 2050 is in is already in deep, deep question uh, without massive change, which is why I wanted to show you that graph with all of those different ways which we can create a paradigm shift where we start not to think about needing such a level of High, highly intense development and high intense use of materials. Um, but it's it's a complicated, you know, it's a big question and it's a, it's a good question, but look at Julian Allwood and I think you'll realize, you know, there are things that we will not be able to do in 10 or 20 years time. Good, I, I've saved my final two questions as relating to our younger professionals who um, are the ones who will be really grappling with this in, in a few years time. Um, this question comes from Killian McLaughlin at the Technological University of Dublin. Um, he says, my question is, what advice would you give to someone who wants to drive this change forward? What can we do to get the ball rolling? It kind of depends where you are, um, you know, what, what, what place you've got. But I think find your allies. Find your allies and with them develop your agenda. So 
maybe that's about finding a group of people. Maybe it's to do with, you know, if you're a structural engineer, then maybe it's to do with a regional group at the iStruct um, Find those those allies, and you can you can start to work. You know, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to start to influence the thinking in the companies that the, that you're working in, and and start to take it up to board level and start to say you're not doing enough? Um, do you want to take it into local government? Do you want to join um, Extinction Rebellion? Um, but I think find allies and, and take grow your agenda as to what you want to do with it. There's, there's no magic agenda, really. Um, and make those allies as diverse as you possibly can, I'd say. That's something that takes a bit of work. But, but bring allies that aren't just of your mold. So that probably means going cross-disciplinary. It means you know, like, like I'm doing, you know, trying to go out there and mix with many different aspects of the industry. I'm, I'm not going far enough. But a diverse set of allies and develop an agenda and then go for it passionately. And the more you read, the more passionate you'll get because you will realize that intelligent thinking is telling us it's not hopeless, but they're telling us we really need to act. Thank you. And uh, for the final question, I, I consider this to be a very, very good, very pertinent question from Timbe Joseph. He says, congratulations, Dr. Mike. What do you see as the role of young consulting engineers in developing countries in Africa in the fight for sustainable construction? Again, I think it, there's so many levels that you can operate on. Um, I don't think you even need to be in Africa to have a, a major impact. You know, you can. So if you're if you're in in Africa, I think the important thing is is think think about future generations. Perhaps don't think just about the present situations, um, which of course you're probably there to solve. But look at yes, but what in five years' time? in this circumstance? Am I preparing these people for a longer term? And I, am I preparing them for change, climate change levels? What could I do better? So I suppose this is going beyond the brief. It's, it's probable that you're there to do a job. Um, but look further, look into the future, look what else you could do, and then start to think about who, you, again, it's allies, who you need to do that with, and then take that, take that to, a, to a higher level. So start questioning. Um, why you're there, which is, is in a way what the, what the question is suggesting. Um, there's no there's no magic bullet, but but just always go look at the boundaries and look at the time boundaries of how things will change and get really well informed about that. So that when you have a chance to talk to people about, do you realize in the future, you know, this, the likely scenario here is, is with temperature change and, and sea level rises or whatever it is, this is where we'll be. Are we thinking about that enough? So be the questioner rather than just giving the answers. And maybe that's a good thing to end on, actually, that the engineer needs to be asking the questions, uh, the right questions about the planning for the future to whoever they're talking to, not just giving the answers that's expected of them. OK, thank you so much. Mike, that, thank you for the fabulous, albeit hugely challenging address you've just delivered. Um, a wonderful presentation delivered with appropriate humor, which gave us a fascinating insight into your career and how it developed those amazing structures you've been privileged to work on and the amazing people you've been privileged to work with. Um, it's a presentation which highlighted not only your in-depth knowledge of the all-important subject of climate change and the emergency we find ourselves in, but a lecture which also reflected your passion as you drive forward an agenda for change. The audience tonight uh, speaks for itself. Um, some 370 plus attended online. And like me, they've got their money's worth. Thank you very much. Um, were we together in person, I would now call on everyone to express their thanks in the time-honored fashion. Mike. Our best um, thanks to you and our heartiest congratulations. Very well done. You will now hear me clapping on behalf of all. And in conclusion, in conclusion, thank you all for attending and making this event such a success. Thank you, Mike. Good night, everyone. Thank everyone. And thank you to everyone for good questions and for staying with us. Um, and if you want to contact me, you'll find me, no problem. Mm -hmm.